the bike where you're asked to integrate a tangent of x, right? So let's do that one because you don't know how to integrate it yet. So I think the problem was f of x is the natural log of the secant of x. Is that the one you're asking about? Uh, yes. Uh, I have an issue with that one too, but I was asking That's about not the one. I thought yeah, this I, was the one we had a problem with. I was like, you over this. Okay. But this gives you an arc length integral that we haven't covered yet. So I'm going to just show you how to do that arc length integral. It gives us an integral that we haven't covered yet. And so, in order to compute the arc length, I don't remember the interval. It's zero to four. I, I did. On what, what interval? From zero, where? X equals zero to four. X is zero to four? Come on, fellas. Oh, this, this is on Blackboard, y'all. <laughs> okay, so I don't know which problem this is. Was it even one that I asked you to turn in? I don't, yeah, it was. Yes. Number well, that's too bad. Oh, well, you'll all turn it in correctly. Okay, so we're finding the arc length. And so our formula for arc length is in rectangular coordinates, the integral from A to B of the square root of one plus F prime all squared times BX. We could do also as functions of Y. Does that fit? Yes. Okay, so we need a derivative. It's a logarithm. So the derivative of log of u is one over u times u prime. So one over the secant of x. What's the derivative now of the secant of x? Secant tangent. Secant times the tangent. <clears throat> you can cancel the secants, right? Cancel the secant, so f prime is just gonna be the secant of x. Tangent of x. I'm sorry, tangent of x. They cancel sequence. And so in here, we're going to have one plus the tangent of x all squared under the radical sign. <laughs> yeah, are you recording? I'm recording. There's okay. a dot in my cloud. <laughs> I check. <laughs> okay. Now, we all know that sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Mm -hmm. There is an analogous for the tangent. If I take this and divide everything through by cosine squared, this says that the tangent squared of x plus one is one over cosine squared. Secant squared. Which is secant squared. So that's what I have here. I have tangent squared plus one. So this stuff can be replaced by secant squared. And that was the trick we were looking for. We need to have a perfect square in order to get rid of this radical sign. And on that interval, hopefully the secant is a strictly positive function. I don't know secant why there's a four. Oh, x. I don't know. I have a theta. And so now we're left to integrate the secant of x. That's what we don't know how to do. But we being you, <laughs> you know everything. I just looked in the back of the book and it gave me the answer. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to do it. That's a good way to do it. Um, I think it was. I, it's it's on my, uh, I on my natural log of the absolute value of secant plus tangent. Well, here's the I trick. Got, here's the trick to integrate the secant of x. You got to multiply by one. <laughs> you got to multiply by one in a really goofy form. You got to multiply by the secant of x plus the tangent of x. Because if you do this, you'll get a u du integral. On the numerator, you get secant squared of x plus the secant of x times the tangent of x. And then the denominator, you just get the secant of x plus the tangent of x. Whoops, <laughs> lost a C. <laughs> if you do this clever multiplying by one and you take u to be the denominator, both of those terms have their derivative present in the numerator. 
You said the derivative of secant was the secant times the tangent. What was the derivative of the tangent? Uh, secant squared. And that's the entire numerator, though written in the other order, but addition is commutative. So this becomes a one over u du integral. And one over u has as its integral the natural log of u. And here u is the secant of x plus the tangent of x. So instead of having to go through those steps each time, maybe just memorize that this is the formula for the integral of the secant of x. The integral of the secant of x is the natural log of the secant of x plus the tangent of x. From x is equal to zero to x is equal to whatever number that. And then you put those numbers in, you don't get anything very pretty. So just All right. So on Blackboard, I just tried to leave it in the formula and then like substitute it in the x values. It didn't like it. Did you have the absolute value bars? I think so. I probably just typed it in wrong. But. Okay. The bars are going to be important because we need that to be a positive number. Mm -hmm. And four radians is quadrant three, so that this would be negative. Mm -hmm. All right. And, that's, and I don't know which ones. So put the absolute value bars right. on it. Thank you. Okay. So that was, I'm sorry that that one popped up there. But the integral of the secant of x is the natural log of the absolute value of the secant of x plus the tangent. There's no way you could have known that other than looking in the back of the room. So I thought that would be your question today, but it's not. Your question was over number 10. Yes, number 10 uh, says sketch a segment R equals secant of theta from zero to uh, <coughs> pi eight. Is equal to zero. Okay, so sketch a segment is equal to pi over eight. So I don't know how to sketch that in polar coordinates. Um, and then we have to. You have to find it as an integral in polar coordinates and using geometry. Okay. That's trigonometry. You'll see that using geometry is going to be really easy. It's trigonometry. Yeah. trigonometry. We don't, we don't like it. It's the same. Thing. R is equal to the secant of theta for if theta is equal to zero. So theta is equal to pi over a has as its graph a line segment. Mm -hmm. but why do we know that? Let's. Look at our conversion factors. Let's convert this to rectangular coordinates. Our conversion factors from polar to rectangular were x squared plus y squared is r squared. x is r cosine, r cosine theta. We're going to use that here. And y is equal to r sine theta. To convert that to rectangular coordinates, I'm going to replace the secant of theta with 1 over cosine theta. So I have R is equal to one over the cosine of theta. Now I'm going to cross multiply and get R cosine theta is equal to one. And there's our X. This corresponds to the graph X is equal to one from theta is equal to zero to theta is equal to pi over eight. Well, let's get those as ordered pairs. We also know that the tangent of theta is y divided by x, right? Or we have that x is r cosine of theta. Um, so where am I going to change that? Theta is equal to zero gives me what number for r? One. r is equal to one. And theta is equal to pi over eight gives me r is equal to the secant of pi over eight. Correct? Yep. Okay, and so, so let, we, let's find out. Um, well, I know what x is going to be. x is always going to be 1, right? Because that's the line x is 1. That's a vertical line. So what we need are the y coordinates that go with those. So let's go here and get the y coordinates for each of those. Okay, so x is 1. So for this point, for r theta 
equal to one zero, our X and Y are gonna be, well, we know X is one. Y is equal to R cosine theta. R is one, theta is zero. Oops. R is one, theta is zero. What's the sign of zero? Zero. So Y is zero. For r theta equal to pi eighths and the secant of pi eighths, I have y is equal to r. Oops, that's a theta, I got them backwards. r, r is secant of pi eighths times pi eighths. But that's just a number. So that's our ordered pair there. So I have X is one and there's my Y value. So without using calculus, you're asked to find the length along the line X is equal to one. I'm gonna get up here shortly. Here's X is equal to one from the ordered pair one zero to the ordered pair one messy number, pi eighth secant of pi eighths. Length of that segment. Okay, so it's just pi eighths. So if you just use the distance formula, change, uh, change in x squared plus change in y squared, uh, all under the square root, there is no change in x, right? All right, distance formula, is the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. So there's no change in x, so that's zero. Change in y is just the pi eighth secants pi eighths. So our distance is gonna be zero squared plus pi eighth secant of pi eighth squared. And that's just gonna be pi eighths secant of pi eighths. So that's without any calculus other than the change in coordinates. Now let's use the arc length formula. Um, we're going to need um, to use the polar version of the arc length formula. The polar version is S is equal to theta is A to B square root. What's under here for the polar version? R squared. R squared. Plus, or minus. plus, everything's plus because it comes from the distance formula, r prime squared as a function of theta. So let's see how far I can write. I can write way over here. Yeah, I can over here. So here's the calculus. If r is the secant of theta, what's r prime? And so our arc length formula takes us from theta is equal to zero to theta is equal to pi over eight, square root of r squared plus r prime squared. So when I square that, I get each of the trig functions squared. Now we got to do some manipulation to get rid of the radical sign. Talk me through that. What's next? Factor out the secant squared. Factor out the secant squared. And that leaves me one plus tangent squared right here. What was one plus tangent squared a minute ago? So this is a secant squared right here. So my radical sign is containing actually a secant to the fourth. When you take the square root of secant to the fourth, what do you get? All right, so we're left to integrate secant squared of theta. 
That's a function we know. There is a function whose derivative is secant squared. So it's tangent. So the antiderivative secant squared is tangent. And now we need to evaluate that. I lost my limits a long time ago from zero to pi over eight. So I get the tangent of pi over eight minus the tangent of zero. Tangent of zero is zero. And so we get the tangent of pi over eight. Why does that not look anything like what we got a second ago? It's a different form. It is different forms of the same thing. I wonder how I could prove to you that. I guess you could put it on a calculator. Um, Let's see, how could we possibly get that? How could we possibly go from one to the other? I don't know, you're just gonna to have to try it on a calculator. They're both the same number. Yes, sir. Um, we're still working with angular coordinates for the, the second R data. It, the r is secant pi over eight, and the theta is pi over eight. When you plug it into y equals r sine theta, it's y oh, equals yeah. Why don't secant, I do a secant pi over here? eight sine pi over eight, which becomes okay. tangent. I screwed that eight. up. Okay. Y is yeah, equal to r sine theta. R is secant <coughs> of pi over eight. Theta is pi over eight. Secant of pi over eight is one over the cosine of pi over eight. And then I'm gonna multiply it with sine of pi over eight. And there's our tangent of pi over eight. So I just screwed up the trig part. Okay. Because it did give us the first two. It shouldn't, right? This is this is better. Demo better. Thank you for catching that. So we did get the same answer. First time I got the wrong answer, but you get by with a little help from your friends. Good. Anything you want to ask? Your favorite color? Red. We're ready to get back to working on work? Working on work? We're working on work. Work is force times distance. The force is not constant. We cut it up into itty bitty, teeny tiny pieces. And we integrate uh, f of x dx, where dx represents the small increment in distance. We can in integrate as a function of x. We were integrating uh, the work done by uh, the force applied to a spring. And so we had the, the Law to help us find the force in those cases. So maybe I should back up and do one or so of those. Let me rub all this stuff off and tell you what we did from last time. We're on section 6.5. We'll do work as an integral. So if force is constant, we don't have an integral. Work is just the product of the force times the distance that the object is moved. But if force is not constant, the force varies. as the position x, then work is the integral from x is equal to a to x is equal to b, a force as a function of x, the dx is representing a small distance in our Riemann sum. So I showed you how to use that in an example where we pulled up a, a cable where we knew the weight of the entire cable. 
We cut the cable up into little bitty teeny tiny pieces so we could figure out the weight of a slice of the cable. And then we integrated that over the link hooks, the amount being moved. If we have a chain, I'm sorry, a spring or springs, the force as a function of X is directly proportional to the variable X, where X in this case is the distance beyond the natural length of the spring. And so if I integrate K times X, I get my work is equal to K times X squared over two over the distance beyond the natural length. So an example of that was a spring has as its natural length, Um, I don't know, let's make it a long spring, four feet. Uh, it takes um, ten pounds of force to stretch the spring. to a length of 4.5 feet. How much work is done in stretching the spring? from four feet to five feet. That's your typical spring problem. Work is done in stretching the spring from four feet to five feet. So when you encounter these spring problems when we're talking about force and work, we essentially have two steps to do. Find the spring constant and then compute the integral. From the first sentence, we can get the spring constant. I'm given an ordered pair for this particular spring. It says that force is 10 when X is well, you tell me what X is, but half of a foot. You say natural length corresponds to X is zero. We're measuring distance beyond natural length. So the four feet puts the end at X is zero, and then we go to four and a half feet, so X is 0.5. So we use that to find K. We have F is KX. F is 10, X is a half. So I got to divide 10 by a half. 10 divided by half is 20. So in this particular problem, F is 20 X. A times X. Now we can answer the question. How much work is done in stretching the spring from its natural length to one foot beyond its natural length? So we just compute the integral from what to what? Zero to one, Zero to one of 20x dx. So I'll get x squared over two times the 20. I get 10x squared from zero to one, and I get 10. This would be units of foot pounds. Yes. Isn't it 
X squared. squared. And X squared. It doesn't change the answer though. Do I get partial credit? You get the right answer. Get the right answer. I get full credit for getting the right answer? You got the right answer. I don't need any credit. I have my degree, thank you. It's well hidden. Well, so if they did try to take it away, they'd have to find it first. <laughs> Was not hanging up in your office. No okay, so you found my hiding place. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hidden. Nobody comes to my office. It's like a labyrinth to get back to. Okay, that was the first type of problem that we were doing. Our next type of problem that we're doing, I have a list of problems. If you run them off, then you have them too. Otherwise, they're on Blackboard. And otherwise, I have a few extras, not many, two, three. One, I only have one, so it's going to be mine. <laughs> yep, I have no extras. I'll take them. Take them, my no extras. Okay. Oh, I got some of your papers too. I guess I should have given that to you while I was running junk off. And there's my trig exam that I've never worked on this weekend. Shame on me. You're too busy going to see Shaq and stuff. I tried to see Shaq. You signed on my roommate's hat. I got three handshakes. Uh, your roommate's he took, hat? He took my roommate's hat, wore it on stage. If you saw Shaq in a cowboy hat, that was my roommate's. It was. And he signed it and gave it back. Oh, good. Wow. At least he gave it back. I've never been more angry than that. He was using the president's staff room to crap or whatever, to hang out until it was time to perform. And I said, take me over there. I want to meet him. Uh, my husband also going to couch. That was oh my God. Oh. I didn't get to see Shaq a lot. Well, I saw him doing his thing. I had to shake his hand. hand. But I want to shake his hand. Okay. You guys have to wear t-shirts to the game, though. I saw that. It took me two tries to get him a t-shirt. <laughs> okay. Okay, so next I'm going to take a, an object that's full of a liquid. And I'm going to try to pump that liquid out, and figure out how much work is done in pumping liquid from a tank. So that's our next thing. Work done in pumping liquid from a tank. That's not a good one. What was my good one? Okay, so our tank is going to have a particular shape. So I'm just going to make some sort of random shape. It will have a certain depth of a liquid, and that liquid is going to have a certain uh, weight density, or the weight density I'm going to assume has the gravitational constant. If it's given in um, British units or metric units, then assume that the gravitational constant is not in it. If, the, if you're given something on web work that's in our metric units, you'll have to multiply by 9.8, okay? So we're gonna assume that we have a liquid with a weight density of, I guess I'll use a delta, and that's going to be in pounds per cubic feet. So the weight density has the gravitational constant in it already. Mass density does not. Um, <clears throat> we're going to take that liquid of a certain depth and we're going to pump it either to the top of the tank or to some sort of height to the top of the tank. So we're going to compute that the work done in taking all of the liquid either to the top of the tank or to some height to the top of the tank. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put this tank on an axis. And I'm going to put the origin here and make the y-axis go up here. Put the origin either put the origin where it's convenient. In this particular example, I'll put it on the bottom. Then we're going to it takes less work to move, say, water from here to here, or liquid, 
than it does say from here to here. So the location of the liquid matters. It's not going to be a constant force. It's going to be variable. So what we do is we take the liquid and cut it up into infinitely thin slices of liquid. So I make a slice here of delta Y units. And then my slice depends on the shape of the container. Maybe, maybe if my container is round, this will be the shape of a disc. If my container is some sort of uh, maybe these are straight lines coming out and I've got some sort of trough, it'll take whatever the shape of the container it is. But that slice of, in this case, a delta Y thickness, that slice has some sort of volume. And if I figure out volume, what's kind of, what are the units of volume? Uh, cubic. In this case, it would be in cubic feet. So I'll figure out the volume of the slice. in cubic feet. And if I take the volume of the slice in cubic feet and multiply it by the density of the slice in pounds per cubic feet, that product will have a unit of pounds. Which of our quantities is measured in pounds? Force. Force. I get the force of moving a slice of liquid by multiplying the volume with the density. So the force, On this slice, or to move this slice, is just the volume times the density. So this is cubic feet times pounds per cubic feet, and those will cancel and leave me pounds. Okay, so I've got force. Volume times density. Volume of that particular slice, that's gonna depend on the description of the container. Now I need a distance. Okay, well, the distance is gonna vary depending on where that slice is located on the y-axis and where it has to end up. So I've placed it at some random y-coordinate here and say I wanna pump it to a height of h feet. What is the distance between that random slice and where it needs to end up? That's going to be H minus Y. Now the volume is going to have the, the thickness in it. So it's going to be the area of the base times the thickness. So this part here is going to have the dy in it. And then the distance is going to be an H minus Y. And so our total work done is going to be our force times our distance. And the part of the force has the dy in it. And this is gonna go from the depth of the liquid because I'm not gonna start making slices up here where there's no liquid. I'm only going to slice between the depth of the liquid. So this force, this volume is gonna be the area of our cross section, depending on what our slice looks like. Area times the thickness to get our three dimensions, square feet times feet, okay? So the description of the container plays a role in finding the um, volume. Everything else is gonna look just like that, force times distance. Distance is in feet, force is in pounds, so work is going to be in what, pounds. Right? This distance here is in feet. This volume is in pounds. And so let's try that. In my first example, I have a cylindrical tank of diameter four feet and height of six feet. So a cylindrical tank means it looks like a can. Draw yourself a big old can. Diameter four feet, height of six feet. It's full of water and the weight of water is going to be 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. On my list, it's listed as example three. 
a cylindrical tank. of diameter four feet and height of six feet. Oh, it's half full of water. Weighing 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. Let's find the work done. We're emptying all the water to the top of the tank. Let's do that as a part A and a part B. Let's take the water a little bit further Find the work done and emptying it to a level two feet above the top of the tank. Two feet above. all this stuff, Get some room to work. A nice cylindrical can. Uh, they've got skinny at the bottom, but so it's not supposed to. But just to make things nice for me, I'm going to put this on the XY plane so that the space is sitting flush, and then I've got my Y axis coming up here. It's half full of water, so the water is going to go from Y is equal to zero to Y is equal to five. I think it's supposed to be three, three feet. Three. Oops, three. Okay, so half of six is three, then be that way. And then this would be zero, six. Part A, we're going to pump it to there. Okay. And so remember, my plan was to take this can of liquid, make a bunch of slices in here. And so I'm going to make a slice and pull it out. And you're going to tell me what the shape looks like. Yeah, if I make a little tiny slice right here, it's going to take the shape of the can. So a slice at some random Y coordinate. Looks like. a circular slab. And in our plan, we need to find the volume of that circular slab. Will we eventually make it so that it varies? Yep. Okay. Boring examples first. <laughs> okay, so we need to find the volume, or black, black is here the volume of the slice. So since it's circular, it'll be a pi r squared times its thickness. I'm doing this on the y-axis, so my thickness is going to be a delta y. And what made this example boring is the radius is the same all the way up through the water. And it's the same as the radius of the can. The radius of the can 
It's a diameter of four feet. The radius here is two feet. So this number is two, and this is our delta y. So the volume of the slice is going to be pi times two squared times delta y. The force then of force that needs to be applied to this slice to move it is going to be our cubic feet times our pounds per cubic feet. So our force is going to be 62.4 pounds per cubic feet times our cubic feet. So the cubic feet cancel, and I've got my pounds. So my force is going to be 62.4 times 4 pi times delta y. In part A, the distance will be moving that slice from that random y coordinate to the top of the tank. And in part B, the distance will be from moving that random slice from that wet, random white coordinate to two feet above the top of the tank. So if this is zero, six, here's the ordered pair zero, eight. So in part A, what's the distance? Six minus Y. And in part B, the only thing that changes is our distance is equal to eight minus y. Because there's some sort of magic happening here. The water has the shape of the container. Well, we're going to assume that as we're pumping it up here, it's going to keep its shape. It's got that magical characteristic there. So I don't pump it through a pipe and it changes the shape or anything. We'll just blow that part off. In real life engineering, you'll have to consider that. This is not real life, this is math. <laughs> now let's put it in the integral. I need my, this is gonna be in terms of feet. I need to take my force times my feet and integrate that over where I'm making the slices. So my work is equal to um, my force times our distance force was all of this, 62.4 times 4 pi times dy. Our distance was 6 minus y. And then the numbers on the integral always reflect the depth of the liquid. So here we're going from 0 to 3. That's part A. Is there anything hard about doing that integral? No, well, let's not do it. We can take the constants out. It is 6y minus y squared over 2. Put the 3 and 0 in there. We're done. And the only difference is the top number for the uh, other one moving forward. The only yeah. no, the other one? The only oh, thing no, that changes is this. The liquid doesn't get any deeper. The only thing that changes is this. So in part B, everything's the same. Eight minus y dy. Okay, that's the only difference here when you change the pumping distance. The shape didn't change shape. The depth of the water didn't change. Just the distance that it had to be moved. Okay. All right. Let's see what the next one is. This time I have a water trough that has congruent faces that look like um, triangles, three feet high. So it looks like uh, equilateral triangles, maybe. What is this color? Rose. <laughs> False advertising.
We've got a vat has the shape shown below. We've got um, an equilateral triangle here. And then it goes back on the board to another equilateral triangle. And then it makes some sort of trough. Put your 3D glasses on and see that. Mm -hmm. Well, you should get your red and blue marker. No, but I didn't. I didn't. I know the dimensions of it. The trough is three feet high. It is six feet long. And it is four feet wide. And those faces are equilateral triangles. It contains water to a depth of two feet. And I want to find the work required to pump this water to the top of the vat. Now that's an interesting word because when you say it, you think, what is a vat? I don't know. Yes, sir. Do you know that the side faces are equilateral triangles? Yeah, I gave it to you that the faces are equilateral triangles. Because if they're isosceles, you'd need some more. Oh, oh where am I? It's, so they're not equilateral triangles because I gave you it's four feet wide, six feet yeah, long. Well, let's take that part out. They're not equilateral. It's four feet wide. And three feet high, so they're not equilateral triangles. Your side lengths are yeah, because it doesn't follow the proportions of an equilateral triangle. Now you catch all my mistakes. Yeah, I. I, I don't want you to follow me around all day. I'm not trying to do that. Okay, so I'm going to do some version of this. I'm going to put that that on my grid. And I really don't need to draw it in three dimensions like I did here. I just need the two dimensional face. So I'm going to put that triangular face on my grid. And maybe to make it easy on me, I'll put the vertex at the origin. If I need to move it, I will. But I think putting the vertex at the origin will be fine. What we need to do is come up with what a slice looks like and how to find the volume of that slice. So that's why I put it on a grid. And so. There, 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 that's the origin. Coming up the y axis, <coughs> x axis. Now let's put those dimensions on here. I said that it is three feet high. So this ordered pair here would be zero three. I also have that it contains water to a depth of two. So here's the liquid. Then I said that it is four feet wide. So if I put that at the origin here, what's the ordered pair here? Zero, uh, two, zero. Um, two, three. Two, three, if I put it there. Right? And this point would be negative two, three to get that to be four feet wide. And now you just have to imagine that it's going six feet back into the, uh, what is over there? Is that a restroom over there? Yeah. <laughs> so the reason I put that there is now the slice doesn't have a constant size all the way up, but it has a similar shape all the way up. So a slice is going to look like just a little, if I just put a delta Y slice on here, and then pull that slice out and showed it to you, 
Do you agree it looks like a rectangular slab? We need to know the shape of a slice because we have to figure out the volume of that slice in cubic feet. So if I pull that slice out to you, it's going to look like this but it's going to have a little bitty thickness to it. That's my dy. Delta y. So I need to know this length, which is going to be this. Let me call that s for now. How far back does it go? So that's going to be 6. So s times 6 times delta y. But s is going to depend on where I put it. It could be real tiny here. Bigger, bigger, bigger. <coughs> so S varies with the points on the lines. So do you agree that S is going to be right graph minus left graph? Mm -hmm. But the left graph will be the same as the right graph, just different slope, right? Yes, it's it's just two, two times right graph. Two times the right graph will do us. So let's get the equation of the right graph. Write the equation of a line that passes through the origin and in the ordered pair two, three. Yes, sir. Got it? What is it? X equals two thirds Y. Okay, so our slope is three halves. Y is equal to M X plus B, B is zero. But the reason he told me X is two thirds Y is my thickness is a DY. I want my right function written as a function of Y, right? Remember, right minus left is all DYs. And so S, this is X right here, S is twice X. So S is going to be two times two thirds Y or four thirds Y. And so the volume of this thing is equal to um, this, this, that, right? Length, width, and that again is in units of cubic feet. Now we said this thing was full of water, so we use the weight of water that we had in the last example. 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. So our weight density of our water is 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. So pounds per cubic feet times cubic feet is going to give us force. The force for this slice is 4 thirds y times 6 times 62.4 times our delta y. And that's going to knock off the cubic feet, and that'll all be in units of pounds. Now we need our distance that this slice travels. To get it to where we say we're going to put it, then we're going to put it to the top of the vat. So right now, it's at some Y coordinate here. And we're going to take it to the top of the vat. So what do you write as the distance? Three minus, Three minus Y. So we take our feet times pounds, add them up with a definite interval to get the total work. Put all this in here. Slip that dy out here and put my three minus y in here. And then what numbers go here? Zero, uh, zero, 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 two. Two. Slice up the liquid from y is zero to y is two. So our plan in doing the rest of this, I would take these two numbers, 
and the four thirds and put it out here. Take the y through the parentheses and have a three y minus a y squared. And then you can integrate that, and put the numbers in. And your units again will be foot pounds. Any questions so far? Then let's change the shape of our bat. All right, my next example, a spherical tank. That means it's shaped like a basketball. A spherical tank of radius three meters is full of milk, weighing 64.5 pounds per cubic feet. Find the work required to pump the milk through an invisible pipe. Um, one foot, the pipe is one foot tall at the top of the tank. Yes, sir. I want to look back on this part in your class. Can I go to the restroom? Oh, sure. Sure. Just... Cool. Right. That's a good question. Are we like allowed to do that? Yeah, just go in and out as you see fit. Weird. That doesn't make sense to me. That's weird to you. You have to get a hall pass. And... <laughs> they can be. You have to get the yeah, obligatory, I don't know, can you? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> That's a part of our teacher training. So <laughs> stupid teacher comments. Can I go to that? Can you? Can you? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it just you automatically get it as soon as you get your teacher license. Mm -hmm. It's like when you become a father. Your dad jokes just exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it just comes immediately. That's it, guys. You're just stacking them. They're not stupid mom jokes. You know that, right? There's, There's no only stupid dad jokes. Because you know why? Moms ain't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, what did I say my next example was? I had a spherical tank. Full of milk. That's the product that uses me. Like, could we just do this? It's Okay, the dimensions of the tank. It was radius is three meters. <laughs> I thought you oh, I can't have the meters because yeah. I got my pounds. Of, so let's change my meters on this handout. Let's make it feet. Let's convert. No, oh, hush. <laughs> and the milk weighs just a bit more than water, 64.5 pounds per cubic feet. We want to find the work. Required through a pipe, through a dimensionless pipe that is has one dimension, it's one foot tall. Through a pipe, one foot tall at the top of the tank. Not here, three dimensions. I don't care about that dimension. And then I got a dimensionless pipe, but I'm gonna draw it like this. So this is full of milk. We're gonna take all of the milk out to here where that's one foot tall. And we know the radius is three feet. So I need to put this on a grid in such a way that if I were to make a slice of this liquid and pull out the slice, what would a slice of liquid look like? A circular disc. But the radius of that circle varies. It's gonna be small here, three feet here, get smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're ignoring the shape of this so that we don't have to do two different integrals, okay? So, if this is going to be a circle whose radius varies based upon where I place it, then I'm going to need to know the R of the disk at each slot. So like before, I'd like to know the equation of the graph. It's easier for me to write the equation of this circle if I put the origin here than if I put the origin here. So I'm going to put my y-axis right here and put the origin right there. So that if that's a three foot 
radius, the ordered pair right here is zero, three. The ordered pair at the top of the tank, since that's a one foot tall, would be zero, four. And the ordered pair down here would be zero, negative three. Yes, sir. Would it, work, would it work the other way as well? It would, but which is easier? To write the equation of a circle with center zero, zero, or a circle with center, what, zero, three. The equation of a circle with center zero, zero is x squared plus y squared is nine. What about the circle whose center is at zero, three, if I made this tangent to the origin? X minus. X squared plus y minus three all squared is equal to nine. And then you'd have a y minus three all squared that you're going to have to integrate eventually, right? So it's easier to do it this way. So if I put it like this, the equation of this is x squared plus y squared is nine. And if I make a slice at some random y coordinate, maybe right here at this y coordinate, the slice is going to look like a circular disk of radius r. Right? The slice is important because we need to find the volume of the slice as a function of the variable y. So it'll be whatever the right graph is. We can get the right graph by taking this and solving it for the positive square root of x. Right? So at any point on the right half of the circle, we have that x is the positive square root of 9 minus y squared. And that's going to be my radius. That's the radius of the slice. Just the right graph. We're on the last one. I needed the entire length of the slice, and that's why we had to double it. You see the difference? Okay, so our plan was to get the volume of the slice, multiply it by the density of liquid. That's the force. So the volume of the slice is going to take the form of a disk, pi r squared times my thickness. I mean a delta y, but I did a dy and my hands are already black enough. And we said that was the radius. So it's pi times the square root of 9 minus y squared squared times our dy. We take that and multiply it with density. And we get our force, 64.5 times pi. I'm going to go ahead and square that and get the 9 minus y squared dy. The last part of our integral requires the distance that that slice has to travel from its position on the y-axis to the end of its pumping distance. So here we're going to go from any y value between is it full? Yes. We're going to go from any y value between negative three and three, and we're going to take it to a y value of four. So what's my distance going to look like? Four minus y. Now let's put it in our integral. The total work is going to be the integral of all of that, my force, 64.5 pi, 9 minus y squared dy, and squeezing the distance right here of 4 minus y. And then the numbers on the integral sign reflect the depth of the liquid. Not zero, negative 3 to 3, based upon the way I placed it. Okay? Negative 3 to 3. Negative 3 to 0. So I've got it all the way. We're using y values. So right? I'm putting my y axis as my dummy variable. If, if we wanted to, we could definitely, could we use symmetry on this? We just go two times the integral. Right, because three. the density is going to be about the same. But then, yeah, it'll yeah. work because when you integrate that, you're going to get a y cubed and you multiply that out. So you integrate it, you get a y to the fourth over four. So that's going to take care of any negative numbers. But you will have to multiply this out, right? You're going to take this constant out, multiply that out, and get you 
36 minus 4y squared minus 9y minus y cubed. Did any great term by term? Plus y cubed. Do I get partial credit? Don't need it. Will you give me partial credit? You get no partial credit. I'll give you partial we'll credit. We'll stop here yeah. because the integration so far has been just tedious, right? So on a test, we'll stop here. Oh, right. But I've, I've worked all of these problems all the way out so that you can compare and see if you know how to integrate a polynomial. So, like, so we stop problems. there on the test. You can stop right there on the test. Set up the integral required to compute the work. I don't so know what you had integrate polynomials as a Cal 2 student. Is that just for polynomials, or could you do that for like the secret stuff we're doing earlier? Well, the, the, <laughs> the point of this problem is to set up the integral. The point of arc length was to set up an integral that you could integrate. So the okay. tricks of using trig identities and completing this uh, perfect squares and stuff like that, that was the point of that section. So you're saying we don't have to do the easy stuff. You don't have to do the easy All stuff. The you have to do the hard yeah. stuff. <laughs> but I want to see your progression from a Cal 1 student to a Cal 2 student. Because easy stuff is useless. Easy stuff is too easy. Yeah. So, right? I don't. They, they, they just want us to memorize the formulas and how to do a roll. Absolutely. I don't want to see you do a forward roll. I only want to see you do some handsprings. What if my wrist turned down? <laughs> and what's the one where you just jump and go? You don't have to use your wrist. Backflip. So the tests are all like. Um, we do short one answer. for bonus points. Well, not because you might get hurt in there. There we go. I get sued. That's the end of my life. What if we get off I feel like getting to laugh at somebody hurting themselves doing a back for the Okay, off. so it is worth it. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. it, it's worth it. It's worth the lawsuit. So is it like short answer? On the um yeah, just like that. I'd, I'd say that and you'd say that. It is one problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's gonna be multiple exam. choice. Yeah, How long are the our tests? I don't know. They're about 10 minutes longer than you want them to be. Come on. So okay. The shape of the tank <laughs> is important in determining the um, work done in pumping water. The depth of the liquid is reflected on the interval sign. What are we about to dive into in the last six minutes of class? Yeah. Well, here's what we're going to do in the last six minutes of class. I'm going to take a plate and I'm going to submerge it in a tank of water. And you're going to tell me what is the force acting on that plate. So maybe one thing that you know from science and engineering and physics is that if I have a horizontal plate submerged, then the force is constant, right? It's just some, some multiple of the depth of the water. So the density of the water and the depth of the water will tell us what the force is, if the plate is horizontal. So we're not going to worry about those problems. We're going to take a plate and we're going to submerge it vertically. So then the, if it's submerged vertically and the depth of the water is up here, then I need to figure out the depth to which point. To this point, force is different than to this point than to that one. Maybe you know that if you've jumped into a really deep swimming pool and the deeper you go, your ears start hurting. You've got more force acting on you, right? So the depth depends, I mean, the force depends on which point in the plate. Um, now, if you jump into a deep swimming pool or into a deep lake or into a deep ocean, ocean, okay, a deep something, something, Not a shallow ocean. the shape of the container doesn't matter, right? Yeah, the right. shape of the container does not matter. Whoa. If you jump into a round swimming pool to a certain depth, if you jump into a rectangular swimming pool to a certain depth, the shape of the container doesn't matter. All that matters is when I'm taking my item here, I'm going to take something that's vertical, slice it into something that's horizontal. So on that horizontal slice, force is constant. Fine. So the horizontal slice, um, what is force measured in? Force is measured in feet. So if I take a horizontal slice, it's going to have some sort of area, square feet. <laughs> Hold and on. then it's going to have some sort of distance <laughs> in feet. Wait, back up a second. Wait, he said force is measured in feet. Pounds. Pounds. Oh, that's okay. what I meant to say. Don't oh, listen to okay. what I'm saying. Okay. Listen to what I mean to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So the area of a slice is going to have square feet. Distance is going to be in feet. And I need to get to pounds. So if you jump into a vat of water, as opposed to a vat of 
Cairo syrup. Are you going to notice a difference? Yes, probably. The density has something to do with it, and density is going to be measured in um, where is my density? Um, pounds per cubic feet. So if I take that area, square feet, distance, feet, now I got cubic feet, multiply it by a density, which is pounds per cubic feet, I got force. So that's what we're going to do. The force acting on a vertical uh, plate is going to be the product of the area of the slice times the distance that slice is from the top of the liquid times the density of the liquid. And that'll give us hydrostatic or fluid force. So I need to write that and then that might be all the time we have. So let's see, that principle of <laughs> vertical plate as opposed to horizontal plate, that's attributed to somebody, I can't remember who. Oh, yeah. Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle. So, so we're going to act on a submerged plate. Where's that good marker? No, that's my good marker. Maybe. Okay, so the force acting, the fluid force, force acting on a horizontal. That's not good. That's not good. That's not good. Horizontal plate is proportional to the depth of the plate. Is constant and is proportional to the depth of the plate. Are we assuming that the plate's infinitely thin? Of course. Okay. This is calculus. In calculus, everything is infinitely thin. If you don't have infinite in some part of the problem, then it's not calculus. That's right. I don't know what my poop like marker is. Through. So you will, what was Pascal that said that? Not just me. We will find the fluid force on a plate submerged vertically. And so, we're going to have some sort of plate. We've got our liquid. We make a slice of the plate of a dy height. And the slice is going to have some sort of length as a function of y, probably, depending on where you put it. So the area of the slice is L of y times delta y. Then we have our depth. I know. And then our depth is going to be in feet. So square feet times feet gives you cubic feet. And then you have your density in pounds per cubic feet. And so your force integral is the product of those three things. So force is going to be the integral of your area of your slice times the depth, the depth, the depth, I'll just write depth, times your dy, and this is over the dimensions of the plate, say from x, y is a to y is b. Square feet times feet of oh, density, yeah. density, and there's my pounds per cubic feet. And now we're in pounds. 
Okay, so we'll do that next time. We've got a test one week from today. So on Wednesday, I'd like to finish up 6-5, and your test one week from today is follow up chapter 6. Okay. Is it in class? In class. Right here. Same back time, same back jump. I love that I have actually Well, I never remember when I turned them in. If you do turn one in, I got it there. If using that is better. Maybe using that is better than that. Bye. You're way ahead of everybody. Hello. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would help if you tell them the things are blurry. <laughs> then I can make them bigger. Yeah, I can still uh, like understand. You need to write bigger. Lose my markers at the end of the day. Can't they stay this black through the whole class? Yeah, I, like I almost made on time. Like, I know that I, was, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to call attention to you and embarrass you. But I was quite proud of you today. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. I'm the only one left, so I can end this. But you didn't meet that. You did not.